The Thran, one of the most prominent novels of the Magic the Gathering lore, was first published in December of 1999. Authored by J. Robert King, who would go on to write other magic novels such as Time Streams, Invasion, and Apocalypse, The Thran was both about the rise of Yawmoth, magic's most notable antagonist, and the fall of the mighty Thran city-states, also known collectively as the Thran Empire. In this video, we will take a deeper look into the entire novel itself and highlight different aspects of the story to better understand what happened overall. To establish the overall look and feel of the Thran setting and the civilization itself, the Thran Empire was a nation that had a solid mixture of both ancient Romans and medieval European countries, combined with the technology and aspects of a futuristic society, basically Magic's version of the Atlanteans. To clarify on this, throughout the novel, there are usages of magic and ancient weaponry such as swords and spears, spells, and cannons within the military, along with overall building structure being made of solid, ancient materials like stone and weaker metals, but also had its fair share of things such as flying ships and other vehicles, stones that had stored energy emulating things such as batteries and nuclear power, high-powered ray cannons, and other advanced weaponry, along with the expansion of knowledge such as medicine, biology, physics, and machinery. These are the kinds of things you'll be expecting in this video and if you decide to read or listen to the book yourself. Just a heads up, the story will be going back and forth from present events to past events since that is how J. Robert King had written the novel. If this is your first time on my channel, make sure you hit the like and subscribe button for more videos such as this one, along with checking out some of my other content after this viewing. Now, on to the story of the Thran. Day 1 In the opening chapter of the novel, the story starts off in the desert outskirts of the capital city of the Thran city-state, Halcyon. Tens of thousands of soldiers, composed of elven, barbarian, dwarven, beast, artifact, and other humans, march onto the capital to overthrow the opposing defenders led by Yawgmoth. The attacking force is from the alliance of the other city-states within the Thran Empire, along with other territories as well, in an effort to retake Halcyon. The attacking ground force is also accompanied by an armada of flying warships to combat the other aerial fleet and provide bombardments on Yawgmoth's potential land forces. While the attackers, known at this point as the Thran Alliance, are marching on to Halcyon, which is a city 1500 feet up on a volcanic extrusion, Yawgmoth is watching and waiting for his forces to ambush the invaders. Hidden bunkers, with thousands of troops, an aerial fleet high up and hidden in the light of the sun, and large war machines buried underneath the sand are all waiting to be sprung on the Thran Alliance at the right moment. When the Thran Alliance is finally where Yawmoth wants him to be, he lifts up a box that is inscribed in the design of the battlefield below with tiny power stones that activate the traps. He presses the first power stone button on the box and immediately afterwards, a whistling noise soon falls in the area of the armies. Yawmoth's aerial armada then swarm and attack the Thran Alliance from the position in front of the sun. Ray cannons from Yawmoth's armada bombard the invading ground forces, inflicting heavy damage to the armies below However, shortly after the aerial ambush, the opposing aerial forces fire back and destroy some of Yawmoth's war vessels with their own ray cannons, which were salvaged from a previous battle with Yawmoth months before. Yawmoth would then press another power stone button from his box, which initiated large openings from the battlefield, forcing soldiers to fall in the space, only to be met with motorized grinders dismembering the numerous bodies effortlessly. Moments later, Yawmoth would press another power stone button out of the schematic box with the effect of large metallic crabs rising from the sands beneath and began massacring the Thran Alliance soldiers. On top of that, with a combination of the five legions of Yalmoth soldiers coming from their hidden bunkers to flank the Thran Alliance army, large scores of death were being inflicted upon the invading force. The Thran Alliance would do everything they had to make some sort of headway with the fighting, including elves casting enchantments and summoning spells, barbarians and minotaurs attacking the defenders outright, along with the artifact soldiers reinforcing and protecting their mortal allies. The Thran Alliance's metallic soldiers were the only units that made any sort of real difference in the fighting. One last button would be pressed from Yawmoth's schematic box, and large metallic hybrid colossuses sprang into the fight. These large monstrosities caused the most damage by any single group Yawmoth had at his disposal, which inflicted the largest amount of damage on various groups of soldiers with every attack. At this point in the battle, this seemed like the end of the Thran Alliance army until the arrival of their Artifact Mantis units, which would swarm the Colossus and slowly, but methodically, pick them apart little by little. The battle at first looked as if it was going to be a decisive victory for Yawmoth, but with the Artifact soldiers coming into the fold for the Thran Alliance, the battle would end up as a long, drawn-out stalemate. 
the end of this chapter, the next part of Yalmoth's scheme is revealed. Yalmoth will attempt to take over the Null Sphere, a massive control station used by the Thran. However, the author does not disclose what the station actually does. In the next chapter, officially chapter 1 of the novel, the setting is 9 years before the Thran Phyrexian War. We are introduced to the character Glaceon, who is experimenting on power stones inside of the Thran Manor Rig with a small group of goblin assistants. In this chapter, it describes the overall look of Halcyon itself, which is basically a floating city above a volcano, the undercity that is below the capital, how energy is being used from the power stones using Glaceon's experiments, and how the energy from the power stones are being extracted using a series of mirrors, gauges, and machinery. Basically, in Glaceon's experiment, one massive power stone is placed in the center of the main room and essentially gets broken down into multiple different shapes and sizes using concentrated heat. When the main power stone is shattered, thousands of different shards are created in its place to be used for different purposes and energy needs. Just like batteries in our world, the larger the power stone fragment, the more energy that is stored inside of it. When the experiment is finished, Glaceon starts to inspect his results, admiring the work that he had just performed. This point in the chapter is also when we first hear the name of Glaceon's wife, Rebecca, and the project she is currently working on for Halcyon, a large floating temple near the center of the capital itself that will be powered by numerous power stones. However, in the midst of inspecting the numerous crystals, an unknown figure comes upon Glaceon and stabs him, uttering the words, Welcome to the Company of the Damned. We are then transitioned to the next scene when we are officially introduced to Rebecca. She is inside one of the Halcyon infirmaries where Glaceon was rushed to. Rushing through the different hallways and paths, and talking to some of the staff members along the way, she finally finds Glaceon. However, it is at this point that Glaceon was stabbed with a sharpened power stone fragment and a piece of it remained inside of his body. Healing magic from the staff was not working. Moments later, Rebecca pulls the bloody stone from her husband's body so they can attempt to use the healing magic. The power stone fragment is sent away into another wing of the infirmary and Rebecca and Glaceon try to converse. Glaceon explains that his wound seems deep and would be hard to heal, but suddenly, an explosion occurs from the other side of the hospital. The power stone that was pulled out of Glaceon became unstable and caused massive damage to the infirmary, possibly hurting other staff members. The scene ends where Glaceon explains who and how could he have been stabbed with a stable and perfected stone to cause him this much pain. In the second chapter, the scene starts with Yalmoth trying to get to the capital of Halcyon. The author describes Yalmoth as being 35 years old, well muscular and fit, along with him traveling in worn out, torn clothes. Alongside that, the author goes on to talk about the previous 100 years and the conflict that ensued between artificers and eugenicists, or to put it another way, a political war between magic users using machines versus scientists using biology and medicine, with the goal of both sides trying to advance the well-being of the empire. The eugenicists would end up being exiled after the century-long conflict, which Yawmoth would become a part of near the end of the war. We find out moments later, though, that Yawmoth was summoned by the Thran Council to heal the renowned Glaceon, ironically due to the healing magic not working, and instead resorting to medicine. Outside the city, Rebecca would eventually arrive to meet Yawmoth in a personal, aerial transport known as a sedan chair and take him to the capital herself. As the two are traveling in the air, the two converse about the different buildings in the city, about the different medical supplies needed to treat Glaceon, and about the power stones themselves. They also talk about the aftermath that occurred at the infirmary, about the attack on Glaceon by a being known as an untouchable, with Yawmoth criticizing the use of power stones throughout Thran society, stating that the Empire is using a power source that they do not fully understand. Rebecca and Yawmoth finally arrive at the infirmary, and this is where Yawmoth and Glaceon meet for the first time. From the get-go, the meeting is tense, with Glaceon being critical of Yalmoth's previous work and stating that he originally voted for Yalmoth's banishment, demeaning him in the process, but utterly concedes to Yalmoth's treatment due to Rebecca worrying about his overall health. Yalmoth begins to test him medically and treats him, all while Glaceon is being difficult with the entire process, mocking him and giving snide remarks at every point in the procedure. It is also discovered in the scene that a year had passed since the explosion at the infirmary and that citizens of the other city-states also had the same disease as Glaceon. The chapter concludes with Yalmoth finishing the test and him telling Rebecca not to come into physical contact with her husband, which causes strife between the three individuals. After the situation is cooled down, Rebecca then escorts Yalmoth to his new personal headquarters so he can continue to work on the famous artificer. Going on to chapter 3, this chapter starts with months passing by 
since the last scene in Yalmoth's room and Yalmoth admiring Halcyon's buildings, which were designed by Rebecca herself. This is where he also diagnoses the disease that Glaceon has, Thysis, also known as progressive degeneration. To help Glaceon, any power stones that were being used in the medical devices and in his wheelchair were completely removed, which helped heal the lesions that affected his skin and back. At this point in the story, we're not too sure if power stones were causing the damage, but we know that power stones were preventing the Thran healing magic from working, and once removing the power stones around Glaceon, he was starting to slowly get better. Yalmoth would later descend into the area known as the Caves of the Dam to seek out the person that stacked Glaceon, or at the very least find the origin of what is causing the Thysis in the first place. Equipped with a small pack of medical supplies, armed to the teeth, with multiple swords and other weaponry, Yalmoth would climb down to the lowest of Thran society. When he eventually arrived to his destination, he ran into multiple human figures, with their skins being disease-ridden, just like Glaceon. A massive human figure stepped out in front of Yalmoth and questioned on why he was here in the first place. He explained to the large human figure that he was looking for the man that stabbed Glaceon in order to cure the disease that is ravaging both Glaceon and many of the inhabitants in the caves. However, before he could finish, the giant man attacks Yalmoth. This is where we see how skilled in combat Yalmoth is. The fight only lasts mere moments, as Yalmoth easily cuts him down with his blades. Before he kills the man, the giant tries to talk back to Yalmoth, not knowing what he had gotten himself into. Yalmoth replies to both the giant and the other inhabitants in the area by saying, I am Yalmoth, and soon you will know my name. This is one of the first bits of foreshadowing that we see in the novel that will eventually lead to Yalmoth's rise to power. After killing the giant, Yalmoth then asks the rest of the inhabitants about the man who stabbed Glaceon. A boy steps out of the group and tells Yalmoth that he will take him to the particular person. The chapter ends with the boy explaining to Yalmoth about how the caves are set up in order to combat and handle the disease. On top of that, Yalmoth finally meets the character Gix, the human man who stabbed Glaceon over a year ago. The fourth chapter starts with Glaceon and Gix sitting across from each other in Yalmoth's medical lab with high amounts of tension between the two. While there were lots of animosity between the two characters over events that occurred a year ago, both Glaceon and Gix were too tired from the ailments of Thysis to do anything about it. During this period of time in the lab, Yalmoth is cutting off lesions from both patients and applying different healing salves and serum to test the effects on the disease areas, all the while both patients complain of the pain throughout the procedures. Afterwards, Yalmoth explains to the two men that he has other plans for the rest of the day. To help alleviate the pain for both men, Yalmoth injects Gix with a healing serum into his hip while he attempts to give Glaceon a drink to have the same effects. While Yalmoth was busy getting dressed for his other plans for the day, Glaceon would pretend to be asleep and tricking Yalmoth into believing that he consumed the drink that was provided. Yalmoth would then make a remark to the supposedly sleeping Glaceon about the launching of the Thran Temple Foundation, how he does not want him to be around so many power stones, and that he would tell Rebecca he was too sick to attend. Once Yalmoth left, Glaceon would try to sneak out by getting one of his other assistants to wheel him and attend the ceremony of the Thran's floating temple. In the next scene, we see Yalmoth taking a sedan chair up to the ceremony along the way observing the various buildings throughout Halcyon and fascinated by the combination of Rebecca's building designs throughout the city and the performance of the Power Stones thanks to Glaceon. The story also goes into some of the details about how this new floating temple would function, what area the temple was going to fly and float over, and also regard the aspects of important buildings such as Council Hall and the Temple of Judgment. After minutes of flying through the city, Yalmoth arrived to his destination where a large amount of people are attending the launch ceremony. Rebecca is giving a speech to the multitudes of people and speaking about a short history of their people, the future of the empire itself, and how this new floating temple will be a symbol of their civilization's great ascension. After that, Rebecca's artificer assistant released the chains holding the floating temple and Rebecca continues her speech commenting how they need to leave the old world by making this jump to the new one. Rebecca then jumps away from her podium to the floating temple, emphasizing that part of the speech quite literally. Moments afterward, large numerous projections appear in front of the crowds from the temple with Rebecca's living image, uttering the phrase, Welcome Halcyon. The crowd exploded in a roar of excitement and Yalmoth would use the sedan chair to get to the highest point that he could get to. He would land on the roof of a nearby building and vaulted himself across to get to the temple's foundation. After landing on the foundation and in a fit of joy, the two would embrace each other 
commenting on the accomplishments that were achieved today. The scene ends with Glaceon witnessing Yamoth embracing his wife and having one of his assistants wheel him away from the temple, frustrated and distraught in the process. Chapter 5 starts with Rebecca on top of the floating temple foundation while the author describes the wondrous designs, reflections, and refractions of the different lights hitting the structure. The author also describes Rebecca's conflicts with some of the symbolism and layout of the temple itself, conflicting with the ideas of how this temple is supposed to help the Thran citizens memorialize their technological ascension within the last few years, and the idea of regression itself based on how she feels while occupying the temple. Moments later, Yamoth arrives, surprising Rebecca, but quickly switching to talking about how Rebecca should be getting away from the temple and her designs temporarily. Yamoth explains to her that every time she works on the design and work with Power Stones, she becomes more and more disconnected with the people she is trying to help in the first place. On top of that, Yamoth tells her that she needs to tell Gix, Glaceon, and herself some distressing news. Rebecca becomes convinced, and the two head down from the temple foundation. The next scene takes us to a conversation between Gix and Glaceon, arguing in the infirmary beds over how the upper class of Halcyon have treated the lower class citizens of the capital in the past. Gix is infuriated with Glaceon, the upper class, and the Thran government itself for forcing some of the people and the lower class citizens into the caves of the dam, far below the city itself. Glaceon fires back saying that the people who were cast out deserve what they got and that the outcasts don't belong in Thran society. In short, class warfare was basically being waged on the poor and the people who didn't belong in order to make Halcyon ascend not just technologically, but genetically and culturally as well, playing along the aspiration of Rebecca and Glaceon's idea of perfection. Yamoth and Rebecca come into the room, interrupting the verbal fight that was occurring just seconds before. Yamoth then gives the bad news to all occupants. Power stones are causing thysis through large concentrations of exposure throughout the city, basically magic's version of nuclear radiation. The long exposure for power stones are preventing living things from regenerating their cells properly, causing widespread skin damage and other bodily harm as well. While some citizens have higher amounts of body resistance against the power stone exposure, eventually people will become afflicted with enough time to power stones. Glaceon became enraged at the news and exclaimed that the Thran had been using power stones for thousands of years and that he will get the council to banish him once again for this sort of blasphemy. To prove his point, Yamoth takes a scalpel and a power stone fragment and cuts open the part of Gix's body, placing the fragment next to the wound, which makes the wound turn brown along with blood gushing out. Gix groans in pain from the cut and the power stone exposure, which leaves Rebecca trying and getting Yamoth to stop. Yamoth during the scene also goes on about how he will save both Glaceon's life and the life of the untouchables in the caves while being hugely frustrated with the man who is trying to cast him out once more. The scene ends with Rebecca admitting that he may indeed find a cure, but not to forget about the people who he is trying to help, basically reminding him of his advice that he gave at the beginning of the chapter to Rebecca. Progressing to the next chapter, chapter 6, this chapter starts with the author describing Glaceon's disgust of Yamoth, how much of an annoyance Gix was, and how Rebeck and some of the doctors were attending studiously to Gix's condition, even though Glaceon suspects that Gix is faking his pain. After Rebeck ends up leaving the infirmary room, Glaceon then goes into a thought experiment of how the inside of a power stone converts its matter into energy and the process that it goes about, and more of his ideas into power stone theory that will help him win back the favor of Halcyon. This thought experiment helps him fall asleep, but soon after falling asleep, Gix tries to strangle him to death. Glaceon realizes what is going on and convinces Gix that if he kills him, that he will die, which Gix fires back that they are both dead anyway and that Yamoth cannot save them. Gix then escapes the infirmary room and Glaceon tries to sound the alarm, but is not loud enough to be heard. The scene ends with the author knowing of how Glaceon's influence is waning while Yamoth is growing. Switching scenes, our story takes place to the Thran Council Hall where we see Rebecca and Yamoth arguing with the elders about the Thysis situation. A few of the elder leaders from Halcyon and the other Thran city-states question Yamoth about his loyalty to the Thran, how he's going to combat the situation throughout the capital. Yamoth's plan, medical facilities, supplies, manpower, funding, and the right to screen citizens in order to track and minimize the spread of Thysis, believing at this point in the story that the disease is contagious. Moments later, Jameth, the highest elder of Halcyon, comes up to speak in front of the assembled council and opens a letter from Glaceon. In the letter itself, Glaceon expresses how he has suffered drastically more from Yawmoth's experiments than the Thysis itself. 
Grayson proposes that the council banish Yalmoth once more and declare him an enemy of the state. When Jameth finishes, another elder speaks about how they cannot vote on Glaceon's proposal while Yalmoth's own proposal is on the table. Yalmoth then quickly replies that the proposals be combined, putting the council in between a rock and a hard place. If the council votes yes, then Yalmoth becomes banished, but leaves Halcyon to die by Thysis. If the council votes no, then Yalmoth gets his funding and his facilities to combat the disease, but is granted some power within the Thran government. As the council is voting, Rebecca and Yalmoth are holding hands, waiting for the result to come to pass. The result of the vote? Yalmoth would get the means to combat the city-wide disease. The chapter fast forward to Rebecca thinking of how the future events will play out. She thinks about her and Glaceon and what is up next for Halcyon. On top of that, she now resorts to the idea that Yalmoth is the only one that could save the capital from this violent plague. The chapter ends with Gix climbing back down to the Caves of the Dam in an effort to rally the untouchables upward to Halcyon. Shortly afterwards, he convinces hundreds of disease-ridden people to climb up the capital to make the Halcyon citizens pay for their crimes against the Thran outcast. Moving on to chapter seven, the chapter starts off with one of the infirmary wings that was granted to Yalmoth. They are going in the room that Glaceon is in, and while Glaceon is going on one of his typical snide remarks to Yalmoth, Yalmoth is cutting off different layers of the affected skin to show groups of medical observers and students how Thysis is affecting human flesh, along with just going over basic anatomy and physiology. However, one of the students, a young man by the name of Zod, goes over how some magic affects the world and how different colors of mana function. While at first, he completely disregards Zod's idea as nonsense, when Zod mentions of the idea of certain metals being able to block different types of magic, he almost starts to make a mockery of him until he stumbles upon what Zod is saying. In a matter of seconds, Yalmoth scrambles around the infirmary room to find other metal tools that have iron or rust on them, along with ordering some of the students to start scraping some of the rust off the iron railing outside the room. While that is going on, the untouchables start to rise from beneath the city and begin attacking people on the street with makeshift weapons and anything they could find. Yalmoth continues to tell the medical students to keep scraping off the rust from anywhere they could find as they will attempt to make a cure off of Zod's unique idea. The scene changes to the city streets where Gix, at this point in the chapter, has murdered multiple people with a broken off metal pipe. While Gix killed another man outside of his home, the Houseside Guard arrive, but they are only armed with blunted pole arms, unimpressive body armor, and frightened beyond belief. Gix and the Untouchables charge the Houseside Guard, killing them easily and relentlessly. Then they charge up to Rebecca's Thran Temple. In our next scene, we are back in the infirmary, where Yalmoth is handing his personal weapons to the four medical observers in an effort to protect the room. Armed with his large sword on hand, Yalmoth leaves the students behind and goes to search for an untouchable to test the cure on. One untouchable, without any visible lesions, throws a makeshift weapon at him, but Yalmoth quickly bats away the object and kills him in an instant. He then walks a few more steps, where he sees another untouchable about to rape a woman who is weeping over her dead husband. He captures this particular untouchable and comes back to the infirmary room. To Yalmoth's surprise, the students were able to successfully defend themselves from an attacker that broke into the room, with Zod launching the killing blow. With the newly captured untouchable being forced onto one of the medical tables, there was enough rust and metal to concoct a temporary treatment. Yalmoth gives the cure to the untouchable to test its effects, and the treatment is a success. The untouchable notices the treatment working, but one of the medical observers brings a vial of poison during the treatment test. Yalmoth talks to the untouchable to tell him about the treatment and then immediately ejects the untouchable with the poison after telling him about the crimes that he had committed and that he is revoking the life that he just gave. Zod and the medical observers hold on to the untouchable and he ends up convulsing on the table. The rest of the chapter ends with the continuous rioting and violence. The Halcyon citizens start to realize that they are being attacked by humans, by their own citizens. Going on to chapter 8, this chapter starts with Rebecca and her crew working on the Thran Temple. Rebecca and her crew members notice the rioting and killing down below and try to find ways to prepare for the Untouchables attack. As far as the defense is concerned, the temple crew takes anything they could find for weapons and try to block off the only way up to the temple. The Untouchables have to jump across in order to kill the workers on the temple foundation and they could only jump a couple people at a time at best. We switch back to the scene at the infirmary and Yalmoth, along with the other observers, where the group is preparing to go into the street. 
It is noted in this chapter that there is a total of 21 people, excluding Glaceon's guards, which were the four main observers, Yamov, and 16 other medical observers and students who equipped themselves with broken off table legs and anything else that could be salvaged. While traveling the streets, three students were killed during the fighting. However, the rest of the group not only survived, but killed many untouchables in the process. Yalmoth tells the group that they must travel to the Thran Temple, hypothesizing that Gix was bound to be there. The next scene is back at the Thran Temple, and Rebecca's crew are holding off the attackers. Rebecca has killed 10 people at this point in the scene, using long poles and the narrow pass that leads to the floating temple. Anytime the untouchable attempts a jump, Rebecca or one of her crew members will knock them off in midair, leaving the invaders falling to their deaths. While taking only minimal casualties, the temple crew holds off against the untouchables for the time being. Meanwhile, back in the streets, Yalmoth and his medical observers continue to cause havoc against the Thran rebels, killing them fearlessly. Among the medical observers, Zod exhibits the most skill in battle surprisingly, slaying numerous untouchables easily, which earns Yalmoth's respect. While Yalmoth's group is almost to the temple, Gix arrives at the temple first. Untouchables eventually broke off a door on one of the homes below and make a makeshift bridge, swarming the foundation in minutes. Surrounding the temple crew, Gix starts to spout off his hate for Glaceon and his hate for the Thran manor rig that was built on top of the caves of the dam, exposing all the untouchables to the massive power stone radiation and thus causing phthisis. Suddenly, Yamoth arrives to the temple via a sedan chair and tries to convince Gix to stop the riots. Yamoth tries to tell Gix that he has a treatment for the disease but Gix questions the legitimacy of his claim. Eventually, Gix gives in to try the serum for himself and his lesions start to go away. The chapter and the overall first portion concludes with Gix and Yamoth agreeing to the proposal that the untouchables retreat back into the caves and in one week's time, Yamoth must bring enough doses of this new treatment to help all the people below Halcyon, else another uprising will commence. Jumping forward into the next chapter, we accelerate forward back to the present event, where it is the second day of the Thran Phyrexian War. Yamoth is up on his war caravel, admiring the massive structure known as the Null Sphere, a massive control station controlled by the Thran in which he wants to take control of. Calling one of his Phyrexian commanders, Yamoth coordinates a strike force in an effort to take out the Null Sphere's defenses. The station is grounded in a mountain pass with a single road leading up to the station itself, and the strike force will attack a position of the defense that is situated on part of the mountain shelf. With the plan coordinated, the strike force initiates their plan. The war caravel swarms into position and fires upon the local garrison with their ray cannons, exchanging fire with the armed ramparts that are equipped with bombards, firing stone ammunition. After the initial fighting, with one bombard left, Nomoth tries their best to take it out, but take a direct hit and have to force the airship into a blown out wall they caused moments earlier. Nomoth orders the strike force to get ready for the gunners to clear out the last of the bombard, and for the rest of the crew to abandon ship. The war caravel smashed into the staging ground, with some of the crew members evacuating from it, while the strike force occupy the lifeboats to head for the Null Sphere. Meanwhile, the companion ship that escorted Yalmoth's own vessel was able to knock out the last bombard, but after taking much damage, the ship's core went critical and caused the ship to explode, killing the captain and crew on the vessel. With the defenses down, the Phyrexian strike force continued the mission, splitting up with one group, arriving at another part of the garrison to serve as a distraction with another group flying to the top of the Null Sphere itself. Thran soldiers, armed with power stone crossbows, fire at the first Phyrexian group, but they were no match for them. It is also described at this point in the story that the Phyrexians are described in detail. Horrific, unstoppable monsters who are armored by different body parts of their slain enemies. While that is going on, we are switched to the second part of the strike force who have blown a hole at the top of the Null Sphere and take over the command center. As Yalmoth's group takes over the main room, the Thran operator tries to intervene and she begins to question why they are here. After realizing that Yalmoth is personally operating this mission, she starts to question on what they are going to do with the Null Sphere. The scene ends with the Phyrexians activating the Null Sphere's flight mode and propel the Thran station up into the sky above. In chapter nine, we start the second portion of the book with a crowd of people gathering for Yalmoth inside of Halcyon. People have found out that Yalmoth has stopped the riots and the Thran Council has decided to award Glaceon's council seat to him. He then gives a speech about the events that happened the week before, criticizes the current state of the Thran military and how useless they were during the riots, and presents the treatment to the crowd to show them what he used to end the riots, 
giving hope to everyone there. Yamoth would then promise to not only find a permanent cure for Thysis, but to find cures for other ailments and even mortality itself. He finishes his speech by reassuring the people of Haoxiang that he will keep the untouchables in the Caves of the Damned, to restructure the army to become better trained and equipped for combat, and to fulfill his promise to the inhabitants of the caves by administering the Thysis treatment. In the next scene, we see Yamoth descend into the Caves of the Damned with some of the Thysis treatment with him. Gix arrives to meet Yamoth, and Yamoth tells him that he only has a thousand doses, which Gix tells him that is less than half needed to treat everyone in the caves. Yamoth compromises with Gix, saying that the other doses are back in Halcyon, and that everyone will be treated if he gets right to work immediately. While the treatment is being administered, Yamoth and Gix talk about why Gix stabbed Glaceon in the first place. Gix admits that he hates the citizens of Halcyon, not because of the Power Stone radiation from the Mana Rig, but that they were cut off from Thran society altogether and forced to live in the caves. Yamoth compares the situation with the untouchables of gangrenous body parts being separated from the rest of the healthy body in order for the body to survive. It is also discovered from this conversation that the caves used to be a prison colony for Thran criminals to serve their time, but once their time had been served, the prisoners would have sent back into Thran society. In short, ascension and progression are major themes throughout the novel. However, Gix questions Yalmoth's intentions. He realizes that Yalmoth is trying to influence the people of the caves and to win them over. Yalmoth responds to him by saying that he is the only one offering any real solution for them and that they should be thankful for his treatment. He then becomes angry and demands Gix that he keep quiet about him and to only talk about him in the best light possible. If not, Yalmoth will not administer the treatment to them, leaving Gix in quite a predicament. The chapter ends with a young boy coming up to Gix and asking if he could receive treatment. Yamoth sarcastically says the same question to Gix, which forces Gix to give in and let Yamoth administer the Thysis treatment. Moving on to chapter 10, the chapter starts off with a letter being presented throughout the city about the signs of Thysis. The letter talks about the citizens of Halcyon to be on the lookout for symptoms of the disease and to report any symptoms listed below in the letter. While the main symptom of Thysis is that of dark skin lesions on the human body, a ridiculously large list of symptoms which in large part can be symptoms associated with almost any disease that is known at the time. It is discovered that governmental power had been granted to Yalmoth to deal with the Thysis crisis and not just healing and controlling it, but also be able to enact ordinances that questionably restrict certain rights of the house on citizens. Continuing on with the chapter, the author describes that Yalmoth's day consists of administering the treatment to train medical observers in combating Thysis and for further research into the disease. He tends to as many people as he possibly can, and we also start to see that some of Yamoth's government opposition, that he is giving different diagnoses to his political opponents in an effort to put them in a sort of lockdown. On one of Yamoth's medical visits to some of the Halcyon homes, Rebecca is able to catch up with him, and the two converse about Glaceon's health. Rebecca states that Glaceon is not responding to the treatment and argues to Yamoth that he needs to do more to help him. Yamoth says to her that he is doing everything he can. Rebecca and Yamoth and his group of medical observers arrive at a rundown rickety house that was reported to have symptoms of thysis. An old man, Karen, answers the door and Yamoth introduces himself as the health counselor. The old man says that his wife, a woman named Desra, had some symptoms but was feeling better. The old man was essentially trying to keep Yamoth out of the house, but he and the group barge through to investigate Desra. When the group arrives upstairs to a room, Desra, who looks around her 20s, a large age difference with Karen, questions on why the medical group is there in the first place. Desert figures out that Karen, her husband, was the one that reported her in the first place. The group notices numerous jewels throughout the room, along with a jewel on Desert's neck, who was naked at the time when they came in, and they converse back and forth about her symptoms. The scene devolves into Desra talking about how nobody in the house has thysis symptoms along with Desra spewing hate toward the untouchables themselves, stating that the damned should remain damned. Yalmoth replies by defending the untouchables as one of his party members were from the caves and the situation starts to become contentious. The medical workers do an initial examination of the woman and find no legions. Yalmoth is about to finish up his investigation when Rebecca notices the shape of the necklace Desra is wearing. Rebecca states that this is a particular type of necklace which was designed by Glaceon can alter the appearance of the wearer. A brief conflict ensues when Rebecca steals the necklace, but is hurt when Desert claws 
and tears at her arm. When the necklace is removed, an obese, thytic laden woman is shown instead. Furious, Yamoth verbally assaults the couple for putting the lives of so many people at risk by hiding her illness. Yamoth condemns the woman to the caves, which has been turned into an infirmary to help treat the thytic citizens, and Karen, despite all the problems that they were going on between him and Desert earlier in the chapter, decides to go with her. The chapter ends with Yamoth telling the couple that their home will be used to house untouchable inhabitants that are cured of the disease in order to become integrated with Thran society. On top of that, Yamoth attends to Rebecca's wounds and promises that she will get the best treatment, second only to Glaceon, and Rebecca thanking Yamoth for all that he has done. In chapter 11, we start this chapter off where the caves of the dam have finished putting up an elevator lift. A group of people to be treated, along with a large amount of lumber, are traveling down to the bottom. When Gix notices the elevator is grounded, a letter is discovered that is from Yalmoth himself. Gix reads the contents, and the letter goes on to talk about treating the new inhabitants that have arrived, about turning the lumber into bed frames for the new patient, when the next shipment of tools and serum will arrive, and that Gix needs to free the 10 people that are listed in the letter. On top of that, Yalmoth also notes that he will be sending more people in the following days. The scene ends with Gix becoming frustrated with the letter and sarcastically comments about Yalmoth has provided them beds for the infirmary. In the next scene, we see Glaceon working on power stone design and theory at his work desk. He finds that when certain power stones act upon in certain ways, that whole amounts of space can be created inside of the stones themselves. In short, whole worlds can be created inside of power stones. There's only one problem. How do you get to those spaces? If he could figure that out, he can win back Rebecca who continues to be influenced by Yalmoth. He falls asleep at his desk, but is awakened 20 minutes later to find his work gone. He calls upon Zod to take him to his wife, but Zod is confused by the statement, saying that they have already done this almost a half hour earlier. With both men trying to figure out what exactly is happening, Zod ends up taking Glaceon to his wife, where Glaceon comes to find that, that she is having a candlelit dinner with Yalmoth. He becomes furious about the two having dinner together, and they tell Glaceon that he had interrupted them already. However, in the second meeting, Glaceon is carrying his new Power Stone Theory manuscript, and Yamoth, along with Rebecca, examine Glaceon's work. They realize that Glaceon's work is a game changer, and that whole cities and worlds can now be created inside of Power Stones. However, Glaceon, being angry at the two with them spending more time together, along with Yamoth examining Glaceon's work throughout the last three years when he would sleep at his desk, takes the manuscript and throws the papers into the incinerator, attempting to destroy his own work. Glaceon states that Yamoth and the city do not deserve his work. Before Glaceon is wheeled out by Zod, and all the while Rebecca is trying to save as much of the manuscript as possible, Yamoth states that this new theory also has a dark side. This new power and stone theory can be used to create weapons that absorb space as well. The knowledge to build a doomsday weapon. Zod finally wheels Glaceon out of the dining room and brings Glaceon to his quarters. The scene ends with Glaceon waking up again and asking Zod where his manuscript is. After telling Glaceon of the events that happened previously, he becomes furious at him and stating that all of them are monsters. At this point in time, it is confirmed that Glaceon's mind has become deteriorated along with developing a sort of split personality. The next chapter starts off with Rebecca and Yamoth aboard the new, highly advanced warship and are traveling to the Thran city-state of Losanin. Rebecca wants to study the different architectures of the other city-states, but also wanted to spend more time with Yalmoth and to get away from Halcyon. Yalmoth's reason for coming here was to analyze some advanced cases of Thysis. Some council members throughout the Empire have contracted the disease. Anyone in Thran society can get the disease, not just the lower class. Yalmoth is also trying to recruit new members into his healing corps, which will both train in medicine and combat, along with discovering new strategies and will also eventually travel to all the city-states to reform each location's military. The author reveals that after Glaceon had burned his manuscript, Glaceon went into a comatose from the shock of what he had done and had been in the state for about two months. The scene finishes with the two mocking some of the backwater structures that are present with Losanin, but Rebecca quickly and apologetically states that she could learn much from the city-state. In our next scene, we are back in the Cave of the Dam, where we see numerous beds have been made from the continuous daily shipments of lumber. However, it is soon realized that the situation in the caves have gotten bad as more people are dying at a faster rate. The conditions have gotten worse overall, and Gix is getting more concerned with what will happen next to his people. 
Gix's morals and principles are starting to fade each and every day that he serves Yalma faithfully, but is also the only thing that is keeping him alive. Moments later, a messenger boy notifies Gix that a new shipment of lumber has arrived and Gix goes into a rant about how there's no more room inside the caves and how Yalmoth is making the situation worse. The scene ends where the messenger boy suggests to Gix that the new patients go to the upper portions of the caves since that area is starting to empty of patients. In the next scene, the author goes into detail about how the other seven city-states have created their own healing and fighting corps and how more exiled eugenicists are coming out of exile and being in salt into the governments of the city-states. The military throughout the empire have been increasingly reformed, purging old generals and commanders and promoting younger, battle-driven warriors. Among Yalmoth's advanced war caravel, Rebecca shows Yalmoth a series of drawings that she has been working on, which illustrates him as a prominent leader, like that of a Roman Caesar, and even as a god. She then kisses him on the lips, but the response is not what she expected. He makes an awkward reaction about the action and tries to ignore her by changing the topic which is deeply upsetting to Rebecca. In chapter 13, we're back in Halcyon where Rebecca finds Glaceon at one of the infirmary rooms. Glaceon has numerous machines hooked up to him that he is experimenting with. The two go into a conversation where Glaceon suspects that Yalmoth is slowly taking over the government by creating his own army and is also increasingly becoming more jealous that Rebecca is still spending time with Yalmoth. Glaceon then goes into a rant about how he's creating an army of his own with one of the designs being the Mantis Warrior mentioned earlier in the novel. He finishes the conversation by saying that he is the only one who knows what is truly going on with Yalmoth, which frustrates Rebecca, saying that he is not acting like his normal self. In short, Glaceon believes that Yalmoth will take over the Thran government. In the next scene, Gix is talking to a crowd of the Thran Untouchables. Yalmoth has been diluting the Thysis Serum over the past few months, and at least a thousand new patients have arrived without another person being sent up in exchange as in the previous chapters. Gix convinced some of the untouchables that Yalmoth is not working in their best interest. The scene ends where the people are asking Gix to save them from the caves and this motivates Gix to try and get some of the untouchables to the surface. The next scene starts with the eldest of Halcyon, Jameth. She is speaking to Yalmoth in front of the council about the untouchables and the liberation program. The liberation program was the effort for inhabitants of the dam to be reinstated into Halcyon and removed from the caves after successfully getting Thysis treatment and if they possess useful skills that would benefit Halcyon. Yamoth argues that the liberation program in the last four months has been severely underfunded and that they are having a problem with making fully potent serums. Due to the low funding, Yamoth believes that to completely help the inhabitants of the caves and to stop another potential riot, he will need more funding and personnel. Yamoth also pressed the issue that should the untouchables from the caves rise up again, that the elders will grant him the power to control Halcyon's defenses, which has been fully reformed and better equipped. On top of that, he threatens the council that he will leave Halcyon and push his efforts to another Thran city-state if they do not approve of the increased funding. The scene ends with the council approving of Yalmoth's new funding and power. In the last scene of the chapter, we see Gix leading a group of untouchables to Halcyon's surface through a secret passage in the middle of the night. At this point in the story, the author reveals that Gix has successfully led 26 different parties to Halcyon's surface. However, Gix is wary about this particular night and states that this night doesn't feel right. He is wary about letting the five untouchables go, warns him that something is wrong, and tries to convince him to turn back, but the group doesn't listen to him and continue on anyway. Gix wishes them good luck and turns back to the caves. Moments later, the group of untouchables get murdered by a group of knife-wielding assassins. As the three assassins are going through the bodies, Yalmoth reveals himself and talks to them. The chapter ends with the assassins trying to find the body of Gix, but Yalmoth instead wants him to be kept alive. Yalmoth believes Gix will be useful to him because he will try to keep bringing people to the surface. If more untouchables reach the surface, Yalmoth can use this as evidence to show the council that he needs more money and soldiers, thus making himself more powerful in the process. In the next chapter, Chapter 14 starts with Rebecca and Yalmoth walking through the half-finished Thran temple. The two converse about the nightly engagements that Yalmoth is a part of with the escaping untouchables and that once the temple is finished, it will create more light when the night arises, thus making his engagements less violent. Yalmoth assures that he only kills the untouchables in self-defense and that she should not worry so much. This short scene ends with Rebecca 
replying back to him, stating that she just wants him safe, and since Glaceon is losing his mind, he is the only person that shares her dream to further advance the Thran. The next scene we see Glaceon in his room, trying to work with his goblin assistants with the help of his new personal medical machines. While Glaceon is still slowly losing his mind, his speech is also deteriorating as well, making his words garbled and most of the time sounding unintelligible. He passes out from the experiment and later wakes up to the appearance of Dyfed, a dark-skinned woman who has been searching for him. Dyfed wanted to meet the man who mathematically proved his theory on power stones along with the creation of artificial worlds and declares that she herself is a planeswalker, a being that could travel to different planes of existence. She explains to Glaceon that she was once a Thran citizen, but attained abilities that let her travel through the different worlds of the multiverse along with her powers. However, when analyzing Glaceon's expressions of confusion and suspicion, Dyfed uses her powers to instantly travel back to other planes of existence and bring back different items to show Glaceon. Moments later, Yamoth walks into the room and introduces himself to Dyfed. Yamoth has listened to the entire conversation through different monitoring devices in Glaceon's infirmary quarters and began questioning Dyfed's supposed abilities. Yamoth would test Dyfed's abilities and remain unconvinced until Dyfed took Yamoth's hand and planeswalked to the world of Pyrulia. As soon as the couple teleported out of Glaceon's room, Rebecca storms in and asks Glaceon where Yamoth had gone and where the stranger was at. Meanwhile, throughout the entire scene, Glaceon tries to reply multiple times, but since his speech had kept getting worse, very little of what he said was understandable. Yamoth and Dyfed arrive on the plain of Pyrulia, and Yamoth states in amazement at the scenery in front of him. Pyrulia is described as a large tapestry of greenery in every direction and vastly different than that of Dominaria. Dyfed also talks about the intelligent life forms on the plain and how the physics of each plane can be different overall. The scene ends with Yamoth struggling to the ground a side effect of the planeswalking, and Dyfed reassures him that this is a normal human response. Yamoth simply replies that he is not a normal human. In chapter 15, we switch to the Caves of the Dam and we see Gix in front of another crowd of untouchables. His speech talks about how Yamoth is treating the people of the caves and is leaving them to die. It has been revealed that it has been over a year since anybody was taken up to Halcyon's surface and the cave inhabitants started to get anger with each word that Gix spews against Yamoth, their supposed savior. The scene ends with Gix telling the people to rise up, which starts the second Untouchables uprising in the novel. We are fast forward a few hours and the Untouchables begin to riot. However, things don't start off as the first uprising did. Hausan's guards, who are much better equipped with true weaponry, kill Untouchable rebels with ease. While this is going on, Yamoth is calm and starts to ready a serum that gives Thysis to anybody that he injects. He has been preparing for this event for quite some time, as he was the one who personally prepared Halcyon's new defense strategy, and he takes out a box schematic in the shape of the infirmary. A mob of 200 untouchables then try to take over the infirmary, but Yamoth presses one of the power stone buttons in the box. Inside the infirmary, a massive crystal statue in the form of an angel falls down on part of the mob, with the impact killing 50 rebels. However, the statue shatters into a thousand sharp pieces and kills another 50 untouchables as well. Chaos ensues, and Gix begins to notice that the traps are being sprung across their area. More people would try to enter the infirmary, and Gix tried to stop them, physically pulling two other people away from the scene. Moments later, the infirmary would become surrounded by 60 soldiers, a combination of both the new Halcyte guard and Yamoth's own personal guards, and kill the rest of the rebel mob. Yamoth would then leave his personal quarters and report to another room nearby, where numerous council members started to swarm in. Eldest Jameth gives command of Halcyon's defense, and soon afterward, Yamoth leads council members to an area where Halcyon soldiers and members of Yamoth's healing corps are assembling. As the council members watch, men are seen bringing large crates of supplies. In the supply crates, form-fitting silver power armor is presented to the group, along with power stone swords that can cut through various objects, such as stone and steel, along with being coated in poison. On top of that, the soldiers are given a technologically advanced helmet that helps the wearer in combat and lets Yamoth track their whereabouts. He then orders the soldiers to equip themselves with these new armaments and to go to their assigned sectors. As the soldiers were marching out, Yamoth and the council members arrive at Glaceon's room where Rebecca and Glaceon's goblin assistants were equipped in whatever they could find in order to defend themselves. Yamoth 
who mocks the shoddy room defense, persuades Rebecca to come to him, leaving Glaceon and his goblins behind. The group then arrives at Yamas laboratory, and he shows Rebecca the box schematic that shows their structure's defenses. Yamoth reveals that they had taken advantage of Glaceon's split mine by starting an invention based on one of Glaceon's designs and secretly leaving it in his room. Glaceon, not recalling anything about starting the invention, would finish the design and Yamoth would steal the item whenever Glaceon had finished building the tool. He also reveals that he had done this on many occasions and that he and Glaceon had built great marvels for Halcyon. The chapter ends with Yamoth showing the council and Rebek the latest of the designs a large tabletop in the layout of Halcyon with every building and sector of the city infused with power stone buttons. These buttons would help Yawoth activate various defenses throughout the city and also help him coordinate with any soldier that has any power stone armaments. In short, he is able to control the warriors. With this realization and her emotion going from awe to dread, Jameth comments on the situation by saying that Yawoth can now control the whole city. In the next chapter, the start of this chapter begins with the newly equipped soldiers killing some of the Thytic rebels. Gix is running from the soldiers and jumps on one of the sedan chairs in a nearby garden. As Gix starts to float away, a soldier John in silver power armor takes a swing at the flying vehicle, but misses and swings so hard the sword gets stuck in the ground below. Noticing the soldier struggling to pull his power stone blade out, Gix turns to the sedan chair and drives it straight into the silver garbed warrior, killing him in the process. He then steals the dead warrior's sword and armor, and as he is walking out of the garden, quickly kills another power armor warrior, which he then drags that dead warrior as well. The plan at the moment is to kill as many power armor warriors as possible and find other untouchables in order to use the power stone equipment. We then switch scenes where we see Zod communicating with Yamoth through his power stone helmet. Yamoth explains that some of the power stone armored soldiers have been killed and some of the untouchables are dressed to pose as them. After speaking with Yamoth, Zod finds a pair of silver armored soldiers finding an untouchable that is equipped the same as they are. Before Zod can help them out, the untouchable decapitates both of the soldiers in one swing. Zod then charges the untouchable and slices them to death. Yamoth then tells Zod to destroy the power armor. However, he tells Zod to keep the sword and give them to other Thran citizens to help drive the untouchables out of the city. The scene ends where Zod is traveling to another street where more untouchables are murdering Thran citizens and destroying anything in their wake. Zod jumps into the chaos and begins vanquishing the untouchables. We arrive at our next scene where Yalmoth is still with the council. He debriefs the room of the latest events, explains that most of the areas in the city are secure, with the plans of attack are next as far as driving back the rebels, and gives a casualty estimate, 1,000 Halcyte deaths to 4,000 untouchable deaths. Moments after, he located Gix who's still wearing the stolen Power Stone helmet and finds out where Gix is escaping to. The House Eye Guard are now ordered to pursue the rebels and kill anybody that gets captured. However, Rebecca tries to persuade him that this action is not right. The conversation ends with Jameth agreeing with Yalmoth's decision and Yalmoth justifying why they must destroy some of the fleeing untouchables. Yalmoth then pulls a blue gem necklace from his body and grasps the stone to call for a signal. Seconds later, Dyfed appears out of thin air in front of the council, and Yamoth introduces her to the group, along with saying that she is a rare human specimen known as a planeswalker. The group then link arms with each other, and the planeswalking process begins. They travel to a total of three different planes in a matter of minutes. The first plane was a world with a red sky, but with little to no oxygen, and deemed uninhabitable. The second plane was a world with a purple sky, flooded with clouds, where the group cannot fall. The last plane was a world similar to Dominaria, and the group landed in the area on top of a large cliff overlooking the massive ocean. While some of the council members were trying to recover from the side effects of planeswalking, Yamoth goes into a speech that Dyfed has agreed to find a new world that would become a paradise for the Thran Empire, that the Caves of the Dam will be the place where a permanent portal will be set up for this new world, and that once completed, the citizens in the caves will be the first inhabitants to colonize this new plane once they have been cured of Thysis. The scene ends with Yamoth proclaiming that he will elevate the Thran into divinity and that even death will have no sway in this new world. The last scene of the second portion of the book shows Gix retreating back and killing any guards that come his way. Suddenly, Yamoth appears in the midst and points a sword to Gix's throat, having nowhere to run. Gix tells Yamoth 
to just kill him already. But Yawmoth replies by saying that he has no need for a puppet anymore. Instead, he needs a willing servant playing on Gix's knee to survive. At first, Gix declines Yawmoth's offer to survive and serve him, but once Yawmoth raises his sword to give the killing blow, Gix quickly changes his mind and pledges his loyalty to Yawmoth. The last portion of this section finishes off with Yawmoth and Dyfed finding the perfect location for the portal to their potential new world deep inside the Caves of the Damned. Kicking off the third part of the novel, we find ourselves back on the battlefield of the Megadon Defile from the very first chapter of the book. Commander Curtis Worthy, leader of the Thran Alliance ground forces, are surrounded by the Phyrexian military hunkered down by a makeshift wall. Meanwhile, Curtis Worthy has been injured in the earlier fighting and struggles to keep his defenses fighting, but the only thing that is standing between their demise is the artifact soldiers controlled by the Alliance. We then switch scenes where we are back at the Null Sphere with Yawmoth and company. They are arguing with the female lead artificer of the station as she refuses to do any of Yawmoth's bidding. When given a last chance to surrender the Null Sphere, the lead artificer still refuses to give up the sphere and Yawmoth murders her by slicing her throat. When Yawmoth tries to go to another artificer to offer the same deal, the man, completely terrified, accidentally relieved himself below, which would end up electrocuting him at his personal station. The scene ends with Yawmoth finally finding an artificer, part of the command center group, to do as he bids and tells this particular individual to command the Alliance's artifact warriors to turn on their allies. We forward back to the battlefield with Commander Curtis Worthy holding off a successful attack against the Phyrexian army. However, it is soon realized that something is horribly wrong. The artifact warriors, who were slowly driving back the enemy, suddenly charge the Thran Alliance entrenchment. Realizing this betrayal, he gets his battle axe and makes one last stand. He starts cutting down artifact warriors as best he can, but a Phyrexian unit charges at him moments later. He is able to strike the Phyrexian in the head, but it doesn't stop this horrific creature. It bites Curtis Worthy in the axe arm and the commander goes down, struggling as he does so. Soon afterwards, the Null Sphere arrives above the battlefield and we see a small orb drop from the bottom and the scene ends with a brilliant but deadly radiance engulfing the battlefield. In chapter 17, we see this part of the novel with the time frame being two years before the Thrain Phyrexian War. The author describes the scene as a city that was recovering from the riots. Citizens and military veterans alike were rebuilding and cleaning the city from the damage that had occurred along with the author describing Halcyon in a state of mourning. It also talks about how the city has come to respect and rely on Yalmoth's leadership. As a reward, the city celebrates the dedication of the Thran Temple and the Feast of Victories in honor of Yalmoth, but a diplomatic caravel from some of the other Thran city-states arrive in Halcyon that carry leaders of the elves, dwarves, cat people, barbarians, minotaurs, and lizard folk in which they demanded an immediate audience with the Thran Council. With Halcyon leaders stating that other council members are spread across the continent, it would take a week for the Thran Council to assemble. The group of ambassadors would agree to stay in Halcyon for the week to wait on the assembly. After the week passes, the city of Halcyon is preparing for the Feast of Victories, with the plan to start the feast after the council meets with the ambassadors. We see Rebecca and Yawmoth sitting together in the assembly as the ambassadors and other members enter the room and join each other's company and cracking jokes privately about the different ambassadors, most notably the Dwarven Prince Delsum. Moments later, the Dwarven Prince walks up to the lectern, brings out a scroll, and begins a speech. He starts off by stating that he is part of a representation of the five non-human races of the Thrant Empire. He then goes on to the main reason why the ambassadors are here, to warn the people of Halcyon that Yamoth is a deceiver and that he's essentially orchestrated the Halcyon uprisings using Thysis in order to gain power within the government of the Empire. Delsum also goes on to list other transgressions and atrocities that Yamoth bestowed upon them, with some of the ambassadors having first-hand experience. First, Yamoth gave the Black Cough to Brince Delsum's people in order to start a workers' riot and help overthrow the Dwarven hierarchy. Next, he experimented with the mold within the forest of Argoth, which this event is noted in the Brothers' War as well, to help get rid of the elves that were present there. He also kidnapped the Princess of the Elves, one of the ambassadors that was present, and 12 of her healers to be ransomed off with the presumption that he had a cure for the creeping mold. The ransom was paid, but all the elves received in return were 12 dead healers and sweetened water. Thirdly, he released the White Death among the Minotaurs to study the effects on the population 
while also introducing rabies to the cat people, who would end up attacking and slaying each other by the effects. On top of that, he poisoned some of the humans of the barbarian nations, and even killed and dissected the leader of the lizard folk. Prince Delsum continues his speech by saying that Yamoth must be extradited from the Thran Council and Halcyon itself. A multitude of emotion roared throughout the hall at the Dwarven Prince's comments, but once the noise died down, Prince Delsum continued. He goes on to say that Yamoth was behind the Thysis and the untouchable uprisings in order to shape the city in his own image. The Dwarven Prince then finishes with an ultimatum. If Yamoth isn't turned over to the ambassadors, Halcyon will have to fight a world with the rest of Dominaria. After the prince finishes, Yamoth takes to the lectern to answer the accusations. In short, Yamoth reinforces that his only goal was to help defend the Empire and to advance the Thran as much as he can. He calls for a vote, in which Rebecca seconds. The yeas and nays sound dead even, which surprises and infuriates him simultaneously. An official vote commences, and each group of elders vote. Each city-state has a slate of council members that vote, and whatever the majority of councillors vote, that would be the particular city-state's vote, an aspect that is similar to representative democracy. With the votes tallied, the city-states of Nyoron, Seton, Phonon, and Orlison voted for non-extradition, while the city-states of Chingnan, Losanon, Wington, and surprisingly Halcyon voted for Yamat's extradition. With the city-state's vote being a tie, the tiebreaker goes to the individual elders of the Thran Council, with each elder getting one vote. The vote would be tied 13 and 13, with the last votes being Yalmoth and Rebecca, both voting non-extradition to make it a 13-15 decision in the end. However, even though he escaped from being exiled, he made sure to remember the names of the council who supported his extradition. We fast forward to our last scene, where we're at the dedication of the Thran Temple. Rebecca was supposed to give a speech for the dedication, but was distraught by the events earlier. Yalmoth comes up instead, and power stone stoles project large images throughout the temple and the city. He announces that due to the various conflicts, the events that happened earlier, and that Halcyon is on the brink of war, he announces that he will dissolve the council and take over the empire. He orders the people present to go back to their homes, with the task being carried out by the Halcyon Guard and the Healing Corps. This order has also been issued with the other city-states that supported Yamas non-extradition, while in the city-states of Losanon, Wington, and Chingnan, Yamoth's forces are retreating in order to avoid a slaughter. Yamoth finishes his speech by telling the Hellsides to not be afraid and that he will save them while also helping them ascend through this dark time and into a new era. In the next chapter, the scene starts with Rebecca, Glaceon, and Dyfed conversing about what is happening with Yamoth. Glaceon goes about how Yamoth is keeping the council members hostage and how he might potentially kill them. Glaceon pleads to Dyfed to use her planeswalker powers to teleport the council members and some of his goblins to another plane in order to keep them safe. Moments later, she agrees to help transport the council members and leaves the room. Afterwards, Rebecca and Glaceon are arguing about the idea that Rebecca has fallen in love with Yalmoth. She lies and denies the allegations and tells Glaceon that this is all over and that they will celebrate and dance in the Thrant Temple. Seconds later, Yalmoth comes in the room and becomes infuriated that Rebecca is not staying a safe distance and putting herself in danger of getting thysis. Yalmoth drags Rebecca into her laboratory, but wounds herself in the process. Yalmoth tries to convince her that Glaceon would not want her to get the disease, and as the conversation is going on, Yalmoth cleans her wound with a vial of medicine. He then later professes that while Glaceon does not want to see her get hurt or infected, that he too does not want this to happen as well. In short, Yalmoth is slowly opening up to Rebecca and tells her that he will make Glaceon healthier in order to fight him for her love. She pushes him away, saying that she has been through too much, but Yamoth convinces her that he will heal him with new, aggressive medical procedures in the new quarantine section of the Caves of the Dam. The scene ends with Yamoth convincing her of this idea in hopes that Glaceon will be back to his normal self. In the next scene, the author describes the scenario in which the council members were in a dark cave for three weeks in a struggle to survive from being Yalmoth's hostages, Dyfed ended up getting the council members and planeswalking them to a brand new world full of both greenery and wilderness. However, the council members argue with Dyfed that they be returned to their homes or at the very least somewhere else in Dominaria. She dismisses their argumentative behavior, tells them that they will be safe from harm on this world, and that she will bring them back once the conflict and the fighting are over with. 
The scene ends with Dyfed telling the council members that the world they are currently on is known as Mercadia by the native population. With the last scene of this chapter, we see Glaceon being transported down the long descent into the quarantine section of the caves. It is noted by the author that the caves have been remolded to stimulate an infirmary, a research lab, and a graveyard. Both the scene and the chapter end when Glaceon is finally transported to his new destination. He meets the man who will both be placing him in his new living apparatus, along with overseeing his medical progress. That man, of all people, would be Gix. We start off chapter 19 with Rebecca traveling to the fifth aerial gate of Halcyon to talk with Yalmoth about his recent projects. When Rebecca arrives, she sees Halcyte workers destroying the aerial gate and installing brass ray cannons on the limestone wall in order to fortify the city's defenses further. Overall, between the five aerial gates throughout Halcyon, Yalmoth installed 45 brass ray cannons, about nine per gate. On top of that, Yalmoth has also been sending brass ray cannons to the other city states that were loyal to him in the earlier chapter. Rebecca and Yalmoth go about the necessity of the defenses and about the continuous degradation of Glaceon. However, the two are interrupted by Dyfed as she announces to Yalmoth that she has found the perfect world for him, a plane with nine separate spheres, with each sphere for the different Thran city-states and one for Yalmoth. The three then travel to the new plane where they arrive on the top sphere, which is an area of large forestry with a meandering river and a mountainous background. Dyfed explains that this sphere has enough land for each Thran citizen to own 1,000 acres of land and still have half the sphere to work with, which excites Rebecca. Yalmoth then tells Rebecca that she wants her to design a new infirmary for this new world to heal the patients in the caves of the dam. Yalmoth plans not only to heal them, but to make them perfected and to become immortal. She becomes shocked by the request and challenges his intentions, but Dyfed interrupts her and takes the group to the next sphere. This particular sphere not only holds up the first outer sphere with large metal columns, but this is also where the creatures of the world are born, or more precisely, created, as this is basically a sphere-wide laboratory. The species that occupy this newly discovered plane are metallic creatures that can hunt and kill each other to nourish themselves just like true living creatures. In short, these are creatures that are a hybrid between living creatures and artifact machinery. While Dyfed explains all this, a swarm of metallic insects are about to attack the group, but Dyfed steps in and planeswalks them to the next sphere. When they arrive, this particular sphere is made of metal piping that channel different energies to the upper spheres. Rebecca questions on how all these different planes are possible, and Dyfed explains that an ancient powerful planeswalker was the creator of the nine-sphered plane. Rebecca then argues to Dyfed that she should not be given away such a plane if it belongs to someone else. Dyfed tries to reply to Rebecca, but gets interrupted by Yamoth, who wants to see the rest of the spheres. Dyfed then explains that the fourth sphere is an area of large furnaces that are not working correctly, and the fifth sphere is an area with a massive ocean of oil. The group then planeswalk to the ninth sphere, which is described as being as large as Yamoth's laboratory in Halcyon. The group then notices a large dead dragon body in the middle of the room, which Dyfed explains that this is the ancient planeswalker who created this world. She also explains that originally he was a human and that the dragon was his favorite form to take, which is why the first sphere is filled with large serpents. Those large serpents were created in his image. An almost ghost-like image of the planeswalker form appears in the room, which the author describes as being similar looking to Glaceon. Yamoth then asks Dyfed, if the ninth sphere controls the rest of the world, in which she responds with a yes. The chapter ends with Yalmoth asking Dyfed if she can link a planar portal between this world and Dominaria, and affirms that by saying that this is the plan. Yalmoth then states, it will be a world of progress generation, of viruses. It will be a world called Phyrexia. The next chapter starts off with the author describing the new fortifications for Halcyon. Ray cannons have been mounted at the arrow gates New ballistas have been added to the walls of Halcyon, and a new power stone charging machine has been created, which takes life force from anything that the machine aims at. The military under Yalmoth has also doubled in size, with the Thran city-states that have allied with Yalmoth also receiving similar fortifications. We switch over to Yalmoth, where he's holding a very important power stone crystal, which will be used to open up a planar portal from Dominaria to Phyrexia. Dyfed and Yalmoth are conversing about how to charge the power stone to open the plane, but this particular scene goes over how Yalmoth will take complete control of the new plane, 
not just as a ruler, but how he would basically become a god on Phyrexia. This is also the scene where we confirm that Yawmoth is trying to become a planeswalker himself and believes that physically controlling all aspects of Phyrexia will make him so. Dyfed explains that a planeswalker is born with the seed of a spark and that a planeswalker cannot be made through this process. She also states that, since he is not a planeswalker himself, taking over the essence of Phyrexia could end up killing him. Yamoth will basically remove all the old body of the previous master and take control of Phyrexia in order to charge the new power stone. Dyfed, seeing no point in arguing any further, temporarily planeswalks away and Yamoth goes through with controlling the essence of Phyrexia. Within the next few minutes, the different spheres of Phyrexia start to respond to Yamoth's takeover and begin to infuse with him. Throughout the process, Yamoth hears the replies of all the levels. We are alive. We are alive. We are alive. When the process ends, Yamoth successfully infused with Phyrexia's essence, with also the Power Stone being charged as well. However, during the process, Dytha was able to snag the Power Stone when it was fully charged and brought it to the caves to activate the planar portal. The way this works is that the Power Stone must be cracked on the top of the portal's pedestal. The only way that you can close the portal is to have an identically charged Power Stone placed on the pedestal itself. Dyfed returns to see that Yawmoth did not perish under the process and after a brief conversation, takes him to the first sphere and shows him the completed portal. The two then walk through the portal and amazed that this worked. Yawmoth sees how the caves have been adjusted for the portal. Multiple wires are powering up different places of the portal with the actual pedestal looking like a glass book with strange glyphs inscribed on them. On top of the pedestal, is where the Power Stone Fragments would go to shut down the portal. Yama sees the cracked Power Stone that was used for the portal off to the side and takes the Fragments for himself. He would then have to hide the Fragments in order to prevent anyone from shutting down the portal to Phyrexia. The scene ends moments later to some of the inhabitants of the caves arriving to meet Yama, with Yama stating, Welcome my children, welcome to Phyrexia. The next scene begins with Yama walking next to Glaceon's healing capsule with an unclear amount of time being passed between scenes. The quarantine cave has been emptied, and the patients of this area are heading to the new infirmary inside of Phyrexia. Rebecca is also there in the room, and is essentially a translator for him since his speech has become degraded over the years. Glaceon states that he is done with all the different treatments that is being performed on him. He is done with the treatments, the health core workers, anything that is associated with Yawmoth, but also states that he has seen the experiments and the hacking and pieces of different patients in the different healing capsules. Rebecca tries to repeat all that Glaceon has said, but she also intentionally leaves some stuff out, specifically about the hacking, repiecing of the different limbs, and the other experiments. Yamoth responds by stating that the new experiments in Phyrexia are not only rapidly healing patients, but that they are getting more muscle mass, becoming taller, and other physiological transformations. He continues by saying that he can try one more strategy to help Glaceon. He convinces Rebecca that there is still a sliver of Power Stone in Glaceon's body from Gix's attack years before, which is why he has not been responding to previous treatment. Glaceon tries to resist as much as he can, but Yawmoth sedates him and gets right to work. After minutes of cutting, the scene ends with Yawmoth pulling out a fragment from Glaceon's body and convinces Rebecca of his hypothesis. However, he secretly placed the two other Power Stone fragments inside the wound and sealed up the incision. In Chapter 21, we start the chapter off with Yawmoth connecting with the essence of Phyrexia through the Nine Spheres. The author describes the new things that have been created since the first arrival of Yawmoth and company. For instance, the new infirmary that Rebecca had designed has now been complete, which have been designed differently than her Halcyon designs. Instead of towering buildings to symbolize ascension, the new infirmary was on the ground because now paradise lay all around them. On top of that, we start to see the patients from the quarantine caves to be infused with enzymes and different formulas in order for the participants to essentially evolve. These patients were not just becoming healthier, but they were becoming taller, more massive, and their limbs and facial structures were becoming longer. In short, these people were transforming into something better, or so it seemed. Rebecca tries to find Yamoth through her area in the plane, but can only find one of his guardsmen. However, Yamoth begins speaking through the guard, and Rebecca reports that the city-state of Orlison had been conquered. The artificers of the city had betrayed the Yamoth loyalists, and the city fell within a day. What is even more surprising is that the attack happened one month ago, and they only just received the news due to the messenger corps being killed off. 
On top of that, the city state of Phonon is being sieged at the moment and is expected to fall. Frustrated that he must leave Phyrexia, he asks Rebek if the stone chargers are ready for use, and she says that they aren't. The scene ends when Yawmoth responds by saying that this will be an aerial battle and starts to prepare his forces. The next scene starts with Yawmoth's fleet flying to Phonon, where most of the city state had been severely damaged. As they are progressing towards the area, Rebek comments that at least Phonon put up a fight, unlike what happened at Orlison, which was conquered with the help of betrayal. He also states that maybe the other loyal city states will fight harder after they find out what he will do at Phonon. Yamoth dismisses the comment, saying that the city still got conquered, and Yamoth begins to initiate his strategy. Minutes later, Yamoth's fleet begin to attack the Thran Alliance Armada that is stationed there with a the battle involving hundreds of different sized war vessels. As the battle is being fought, the Phyrexian fleet start to split off and they begin to inflict massive casualties on the Thran Alliance army. However, it is at this point that we see the fallen war vessels and debris hitting some of the ground soldiers who are still fighting off the Thran Alliance. On top of that, the Phyrexian fleet start using the rest of the bombers to destroy the rest of Phonon and anybody inside the city. This is the event that is mentioned in the very first part of the book, and we start to see some of the events of the beginning of the novel starting to intertwine. The scene ends with Rebek saying that they will probably attack Halcyon next. However, Yamal states that they will fight to the east of the city at Megaden Defile, where he will force the Thran Alliance forces into a bottleneck and have his main force attack from beneath. In chapter 22, this chapter begins with Rebek in the quarantine caves with Glaceon as the battle of Megaden Defile is being fought. Glaceon is noisily ranting about how Yamoth has stolen his inventions and his ideas as he recognizes the different machines, specifically the behemoths, are being used in the battle. Rebek and Glaceon go back and forth about how Rebek says that Yamoth is saving the empire while Glaceon is accusing Yamoth of implanting power stones inside of people in order to control their thoughts. Glaceon's mind is still split at this point and paranoia and fear are coming out much more than previously However, he tells Rebek that Yamoth planted another stone inside of him. Rebek dismisses his claim because she saw Yamoth pull out the original stone that was inside of him. While the fighting is going on, and while Yamoth is being distracted from reading Glaceon's thoughts with the power stone in his old wound, Glaceon tells Rebek to create a control stone and take Halcytes and evacuate from the city using the Thran Temple. Asking Rebek to promise him that she will do that, she rejects him and storms out of the quarantine cave. We are then forwarded to another scene where we see Gix leading an army of Phyrexians. Since the last time we saw Gix, he has sworn loyalty to Yamoth, has a Phyrexian heartstone implanted inside of him, and has been through a rigorous transformation, with his body and head becoming larger, his hair falling out, and him becoming more violent. During the fighting, Gix begins to slaughter dwarven soldiers left and right. Soon afterwards, he and his Phyrexian soldiers then start to attack the human soldiers of the Thran Alliance with his pickaxe, and he kills them just as easily. While he is fighting the bloody battle, he begins to admire the beauty of the Phyrexians and their savagery. The scene ends where the author reveals that the kill ratio was 100 Thran Alliance soldiers for every one Phyrexian, with Gix saying to his Phyrexian companions, forward to the defile. The next scene begins with the third day of the Thran Phyrexian war, and we see numerous citizens of Halcyon watching the battle with many cheers coming from the populace when the Phyrexians caused a huge blow to the other side. On top of the Thran temple, we also see Rebek looking over the battle in one of the newly constructed parapets of the structure. The author begins to describe this portion of the battle with numerous war vessels crashing to the desert floor and causing large explosions, killing many troops in the process. While many lives are vanquished from the war vessels being shot down by the competing armadas, there are also many slain troops that occupy the ground as well from the long days of battle. Minutes later, the Null Sphere appears in the sky over the battlefield and is surprised by what Yawmoth is doing. Soon afterwards, the artifact soldiers that were originally controlled by the Thran Alliance began to slaughter their former masters. On top of that, an object dropped out of the belly of the Null Sphere, and soon afterwards, large white clouds began to flood the battlefield, annihilating both living matter and artifact alike. Yamoth then orders the Null Sphere to fly up farther away from the expanding cloud and to use the mana pumps to recover the raw energy of the Stone Charger cloud. However, one of the Null Sphere artificers that were being held hostage by Yawmoth notes that having this much energy can destroy the mana batteries on the sphere. Yawmoth orders the artificers to redirect the raw energy to the rest of the city-states, which in turn 
will destroy nearly every artifact engine throughout the Empire, essentially destroying whole industries. Yamoth does not see this as a problem, and that when the Thran Alliance officially sues for peace, they will create, fix, and reactivate Thran power engines throughout the Empire. However, the scene ends with one of the artificers notifying Yamoth that since they reached a high elevation, they have now spotted two more incoming Thran Alliance fleets and two more ground armies. The next chapter starts off with the author describing the aftermath of the Stone Charger. The Stone Charger and the white cloud that accompanies it was so powerful that it destroys not just flesh and bone, but metal, sand, and even the very bedrock, leaving a 30-foot crater behind. Phyrexian ships begin to evacuate the rest of the ground forces and transport to Halcyon in order to prepare for another engagement. When the Phyrexian fleet arrives in the capital, Yamoth gives a glorious speech to the entire city that was watching the battle. Yamoth calls on them to become this new form of human and to embrace immortality by becoming a Phyrexian. He also rallies the people to defend the city against the new Thran Alliance fleets and asks anybody who is not engaged in the city's defenses to take the portal into Phyrexia itself. Hours pass by, and the streets of Halcyon have been with either people staying in their homes or going to the caves in order to get to the planar portal. Moments later, Yamoth finds Rebek at the Thran Temple and tries to convince Rebek to leave the structure before the siege begins. Rebek replies about how she had been implicit in the death of all the soldiers from the battle since she helped design some of the weapons that were used, including the stone charger. The two go back and forth about all the damage that had been done, and Rebek begins to confront Yamoth of using fear to help ascend the Thran Empire. Yamoth dismisses her point, saying that even had she had not been involved with helping Glaceon and himself, Glaceon would still have found a way to design weapons, and Yamoth would have found a way for these events to unfold. Yamoth then physically picks up Rebek, and as he carried her down from the temple, she passes out, and the scene ends with both the defending Halcyte and Phyrexian ships preparing for the next wave of the Thran Alliance fleet. The next scene begins with the aero defenses of Halcyon being ready for the invasion while Yamoth is back in Phyrexia. People have began flowing into Phyrexia to embrace their new transformations with Gixley in the process on the first sphere. The second sphere of Phyrexia, Artificers loyal to Yamoth, begin building more stone chargers, while in the fourth sphere, Phyrexian Vat Priests were working on a new contagion as a new biological weapon to be used on different populations of the Thran Alliance. While Yamoth is working, Dyfed appears and the two begin to talk about the war that is going on, along with questioning Yalmoth's motives. She begins to realize what Yalmoth has done. Thysus has never been contagious, that he used the disease to cast out his political rivals and promote his allies with the Thran government to make a power grab, that Glaceon had been right about Yalmoth from the beginning, and how Yalmoth had been taking control of people by placing power stones in them. While Yalmoth tries to argue that he is helping the people, Dyfed interrupts by stating that he is trying to possess the people, but that he can't harm the people he doesn't have. The Thran elders, or most of them at least. Furious by this news, the two go back and forth in an angry conversation before Dyfed says that she will take his godhood away, since she was the one that helped him obtain it in the first place. Dyfed demands that he give up this fight and surrender. Yamoth argues that if he surrenders and gives up Phyrexia, more lives will be lost, specifically the eight original ambassadors that told of Yalmoth's past atrocities who happened to be on the Force Sphere. The two then immediately planeswalk to the Force Sphere, and Dyfed is frightened by what she is seeing. Fat priests working on numerous subjects with different fats, and the subjects slowly turning into Phyrexian horrors. Yalmoth then shows the eight ambassadors who are lying on different operating tables, with each of the ambassadors being dissected and implanted with limbs and parts of different species. Dyfed looks at the horrendous work that was done, stating that she cannot use her planeswalker powers to heal them. Within seconds, Yamoth then stabs Dyfed in the head and starts to move the knife back and forth so she can't planeswalk. The scene and this portion of the book ends with Yamoth telling Dyfed that he will essentially cut open her brain and find the organ that gives her the ability to planeswalk in an effort to make himself a planeswalker. Skipping ahead a little bit, in the last days of the Thran Phyrexian War, we see the Halcyte Armada keeping out the Thran Alliance with their ray cannons and the Phyrexian soldiers working on mirror arrays in an effort to use the sun and burn off Thran Alliance ground soldiers. While the defenders were working on these jobs, the Thran Alliance were working as well. They would begin to place devices that emitted large amounts of thick smoke since smoke warded off ray cannon beams. On top of that, 
the Thran allied soldiers with polished armor in an effort to ward off the sun's rays from the Phyrexians along with the recon unit trying to destroy the mirror rays altogether in the middle of the night which for the most part fails. We then see Yalmoth's flagship, Gaudagon, where we see the defending armada preparing for bombing runs and the fleet being placed four miles about the city's defenses. The crews were having a difficult time to prepare for the extremely difficult altitude and were using various techniques in order to alleviate some of the problems since the crew had to wait until dawn to attack the Thran Alliance fleet. The author also describes that Yalmoth himself had been slowly transforming during his time in Phyrexia where he has obtained more muscle mass, thicker bone structures, and became overall more intelligent. Dawn arrives, and the Thran Alliance fleet has hit a location where the Halcyte and Phyrexian fleets, one of them at. The defending fleets, which are much higher up than the invading fleet, begin to drop bombs and large rocks on the ships below. This causes a significant amount of damage to the Thran Alliance fleet, but even with the large amounts of damage inflicted, about one third of the Thran ships survive and race towards Halcyon. The Halcyon walls begin to fire their ray cannons at the remaining ships and also deal damage as well. Yamath then commands his fleet to dive down the four mile trek at an incredibly fast rate and when in range, begin to attack. However, the Thran allied fleet initiate their smoke shields and ward off the blast. Yamath then commands his fleet to ram the remaining ships, which invokes the head engineer to confront Yamath, signaling that the crew will all die. Yamath tells the head engineer that he will be relieved of duty grabs him by the collar, and throws him off the ship. The scene ends with Yalmoth continuing to ram the fleet. We very quickly switch scenes where we see Rebecca and a group of goblins trying to find a 20-sided control stone for the Thran temple in Glaceon's old laboratory. The scene ends also with Rebecca telling the goblins the ramifications of their actions. If they get caught finding this control stone, they will be executed. If they fail, the city and most of the inhabitants will die. We are then switched back to the aero battle where Yalmoth successfully had his fleet ram the Thran Alliance Navy. Surprised by the action, another of Yalmoth's engineers asked how their ship would hold up while the Thran allied ships easily became destroyed. As he is explaining his answer to the engineer, a ray cannon from Halcyon's wall strikes the Yadagon and the ship begins to spiral downward. The scene ends with the ship going down into the desert plain, but surprisingly, the only thing that is on Yalmoth's mind is that when he finds the gunner that shot his ship down, he will rip out his eyes from his skull. In chapter 24, we arrive to see where Yalmoth survived the fall due to his power armor helping sustain nearly all the force. While Yalmoth is trying to look for any survivors in order to gather a small fighting force, he starts to see some of the ground forces of the Thran Alliance dealing damage to some of the mirror rays, slowly overrunning certain Halcyte Phyrexian positions and slowly marching upon Halcyon. Seeing this with his own eyes, Yalmoth finds the body of one of the Thran Alliance commanders, strips him of his gear and clothing, and disguises himself as a Thran Alliance soldier. The scene ends with Yalmoth merging in with some of the Thran allied ground forces where they will begin the climb to Halcyon. The next scene begins with a messenger arriving to Gix with the message that Lord Yalmoth is presumed dead. Gix dismisses the news saying that he would have felt something and saying that Yalmoth is still alive. The messenger tells him that he is the next in command and is waiting for the next orders. However, Gix is becoming furious, saying that the defending units still should be launching their bombs and firing their cannons. He then asks who sent the messenger, and it turns out to be one of the Halcyte commanders who asks if there has been a change in military. In short, since Yalmoth died, do they give up their arms and surrender? Gix orders the messenger to tell the commander to resign his post in front of Gix. If he refuses to do so, he then tells the messenger to slay the commander. If he accepts, he can be rehabilitated and become a Phyrexian. The scene ends with Gix ordering his steeplejacks, Phyrexian creatures that are basically menacing sloths, as fast as racehorses and can climb mountains, to seek out Yalmoth and bring him back to Halcyon safely. The next scene brings us to the climb of Halcyon's extrusion, where we see Yalmoth climbing with a group of Thran Alliance elves. As the group is climbing, Yalmoth begins to secretly pull some of the elves off of the extrusion, which sent some of the elves to their deaths. Soon afterwards, the elven commander starts to yell at Yalmoth for being so clumsy and killing some of the other elves. However, during the conversation, Yalmoth grabs the elven commander's cloak and tosses her off the edge as well. Seconds later, Gix's steeplejacks arrive and slaughter the elven soldiers 
and Yawmoth is able to talk with the new creatures. The scene ends with the steeplejacks traveling back to Halcyon, and during the travel, Yawmoth recognizes the steeplejacks that is carrying him as Zod, the first health core worker from the first Untouchables uprising. Realizing this, Yawmoth comments on how beautiful he was, becoming a Phyrexian, with Zod feeling pride by the leader's words. We go back to Rebecca and the goblins, where they finally found the 20-sided control stone for the Thran Temple. However, the goblins try to show her what is inside the streets of the capital. As Halside soldiers and Phyrexians are marching throughout the city, Rebecca realizes that Yawmoth has done significantly more than just merely improve the citizens that go to Phyrexian. Instead of just making them healthier, taller, and broader, these people have completely transformed. These Phyrexians have very little human left and instead have been turned into horrific creatures. We then see Gix arrive near the area where Rebecca and the goblins are peering at. We see Gix addressing a large group of Halcyte and Phyrexian troops, and we also see the Halcyte commander being ordered to his knees. Moments afterward, a large Phyrexian beast looms over the Halcyte commander and kills him immediately. The scene ends where one of the goblins tells Rebecca that he sees the steeplejacks bringing Lord Yarmoth back to the city. She then scrambles the goblins out of the immediate area so they can proceed with getting the control stone to the Thran temple. In chapter 25, the chapter starts with Yawmoth thanking Zod for bringing him to the city and for Zod to keep eating more enemies. Yawmoth then notices ray cannons continuing to blast from the wall, which reminds Yawmoth about confronting the gunner. When he arrives, the gunner is blasting away before Yawmoth orders a battle report from her. She tells Yawmoth that she had 17 confirmed ship kills with numerous other non-confirmed ship and troop kills. Yamoth then questions the gunner on various things, such as why she wasn't wearing her targeting helmet, was she manning the ray cannon since dawn, and what she had been firing at. She tries to reply, but Yamoth begins to tell her that she struck the Yadagon and the gunner killed 100 crew members aboard. She drops to her knees and begins crying for forgiveness, but Yamoth gouges her eyes out and attempts to throw her off the wall and orders the nearby soldiers to find a new gunner. Minutes later, Yamoth arrives at Gix's location and as the two converse about the previous event, Yamoth congratulates him on his rescue and for dealing with the Halcyte commander. The scene ends when Yamoth orders Gix to round up any remaining Halcyte citizens and bring them to Phyrexia in order to enlist them as Phyrexians and finish off the Thran alliance. We are then forwarded to Rebecca, who has rounded up about 50 Halcyte citizens and is trying to hide them from the Halcyte Phyrexian soldiers. Rebecca tells the group to try to find food for them to survive and that in order to be saved, they must reach the Thran Temple. She will give a signal by placing a lantern at the top of the temple, signaling the group to go there. In mid-conversation, one of the goblins warns the group of a patrol passing, which silences the group. After the patrol leaves, the scene ends with Rebecca telling the group to stay safe and be ready to leave when Yalmoth goes back to Phyrexia. In the next scene, we see Rebecca examining Glaceon in the quarantine caves and noting all the damage that had been happening to him. Yamoth arrives in the cave and confronts her about trying to take Glaceon to Phyrexit to heal him. She tries to resist, but being very wary and tired from the previous days, she begins to lose her focus. Yamoth starts to bring Glaceon and Rebecca through the planar portal, with Yamoth's health core workers separating Rebecca's goblin companions. The scene ends with Rebecca passing out in Yamoth's arms, the goblins worrying about Rebecca, and Yamoth telling an unconscious Rebecca about how the goblins care for her, how she would be healed by him, and how Yalmoth does indeed love her. In the next chapter, we start the chapter off with Rebecca dreaming inside of Phyrexia. Yalmoth is talking to her inside of her dream, and they talk about her infirmary and its setup, how whole colonies are being grown in Phyrexia, and the topic of Phyrexia itself. They quickly jump to the topic of how Yalmoth will ask the Thran Alliance, as part of the future Terms of Surrender, to become part of Phyrexia. Rebecca embraces Yalmoth, but suddenly, the dream and the world change. In this dream, we start to see both a numerous set of factories and legions of artifact warriors being created along with the artificers working on new inventions. It is revealed that this will be another force that will seal Yamoth's victory in the war and conquer all eight Thran city-states and for the Thran alliance into a surrender. The dream changes once more, and while we still see other artificers working on new tech, the most noticeable thing that stands out is that the rest of the nine stone chargers are being completed. Yamoth reveals that if the Thran Alliance do not surrender, Yamoth will deploy a stone charger for every city-state and will still have a stone charger left over. When that is finished, 
he also reveals that he will make more stone chargers for the rest of Dominaria, and eventually for the rest of the multiverse as well, in an effort to expand the Thran Phyrexian Empire. Surprised by the news, she then asks how he is going to question the rest of the multiverse if they are not planeswalkers. The dream changes one more time, but it is revealed at this point that Yamoth is changing the scenery because when he's on Phyrexia, he has the powers of a god. In this scenery, we see mile high furnaces with large vats and subjects immersed in a golden oil arranged similar to that of a farm. Yamoth reveals that the people who are working here are the vat priests who are in charge of growing new Phyrexians. Yamoth also reveals his goal that he wants all Phyrexians to eventually become planeswalkers and is currently seeking ways to obtain that power. Rebecca and Yamoth then eventually go to another part of the room where we see a group of four Vat priests working on a special subject, Dyfed. Even open with all of her organs exposed, she still lives. However, Dyfed's skull had been pierced with a metal rod, which automatically rotates to keep the planeswalker from thinking. Yamoth tells Rebecca that by doing this, he is trying to find the organ that is responsible for planeswalking so he can recreate the science behind it and depose it unto all Phyrexians. Horrified by this news, she yells at him for these barbaric experiments. However, Yamoth explains that it is better to kill this one woman to obtain this power in order to save their people. The scenery then changed for one last time, and we see that, using the powers and essence of Phyrexia, Yamoth had wholly possessed her. However, before she was taken over, she hid away one mental secret in an effort to hide away something important from Yamoth's power. Yamoth begins to go through all of Rebecca's memories and the plan she had been attempting to do, including the plan to get some Halcite citizens to evacuate the city via the Thran Temple. However, one thing surprised him. With all the memories and thoughts he had gone through, Rebecca did not love Yamoth like he did her. When he realizes this, the author compares how Phyrexia did not love Yamoth, did not love him at first, but now the plane does. And that's what he plans to do with Rebecca. The next day arrives, and the Thran Alliance forces begin to fully invade Halcyon. Yamoth is still in Phyrexia and brings himself in front of his nine stone chargers as artificer crews begin loading them for transportation. The chapter ends with Yamoth saying, Soon, the Thran will know my anger. In chapter 27, we start the chapter off with Yamoth and his company of Phyrexian soldiers arriving at the fifth aerial port of Halcyon in order to free up and use Yamoth's last personal war vessels, Wrath and Vengeance. Yamoth has some of his soldiers attack the area which is infested with the Thran allied Minotaur warriors. However, when fighting the Minotaurs, Yamoth is having a hard time defeating him, so while he fights them, Yamoth questions the Minotaur's honor. In this novel, Minotaurs are honorable warriors, and even when they defeat enemy warriors, every warrior is meant to be buried with their weapons. The Minotaur Yamoth was fighting was using a Power Stone sword, which Yamoth accused the Minotaur of looting an enemy warrior. Enraged by the accusation, essentially being called a body looter, the Minotaur begins to swing wildly. Yamoth continues to question the Minotaur's honor, and the fight continues. The Minotaur finally takes a large downward swing, and Yamoth dodges it, forcing the Power Stone sword to get stuck on one of the bodies that he was essentially guarding. Yamoth eventually kills the beast, and afterwards, Yamoth's company takes over the port, securing both war vessels and the port. The scene ends where Yamoth is given new orders for the stone chargers to be placed on the ships, and to get orders to Commander Gix to attack the Thran Temple. In the next scene, we are back in Phyrexia, where the author explains that the secret that Rebecca was hiding was her love for Yalmoth. While she had been wholly possessed in the last chapter, when he left for Halcyon, part of his power waned, losing some of his control. Yalmoth's essence is still inside of her, and with that, is able to call on some of Phyrexia to try and find Glaceon. With part of Yalmoth's essence inside of Rebecca, Phyrexia obeys her commands thinking that it is either Yamoth or someone that Yamoth wholly trusts. Phyrexia shows her that Glaceon is in the same room as Dyfed and is accompanied by four Vat priests who begin to incise him. Keeping up with the lie with Phyrexia as best as she could, she was able to use Phyrexia and kill off the four Vat priests. On top of that, since it was the Vat priests basically keeping Dyfed alive, she is finally able to pass away. Rebecca tells Phyrexia, through her thoughts, that Yamoth was done with Dyfed and the reason that Glaceon was brought here was to have his planeswalker organ examined, since Dyfed had said earlier in the novel that Glaceon was indeed an ascent planeswalker. She then asked Phyrexia's essence 
to bring her to Glaceon in an effort to get a Phyrexia and to get him up to be dissected, when in reality, she would attempt to get Glaceon's healing capsule to the Thran Temple for evacuation. We are then forwarded to the next scene, where we see Yalmoth trying to call upon nine Phyrexian warships and having the crew put a stone charger on one of the war vessels. We then see the war vessel Vengeance drop its stone charger right outside of Halcyon in an effort to kill off the rest of the Thran Alliance forces. The scene ends with another stone charger being dropped in another location nearby, killing off another section of the Thran Allied army and letting the white killing clouds start to destroy everything in its path. As the cloud begins to do their work, Yalmoth sips on his wine, admires the beauty of the killing clouds, and expressed that the other seven stone chargers will be for each of the next city-states. In the next chapter, we see the Null Sphere, where we see the Artificer crew watch the massive conflict at Halcyon. In an effort to disrupt some of Yalmoth's plans, one of the Artificers in the command center convinces the Phyrexian that controls the altitude of the giant sphere to take it up to higher altitude, stating that they are too low to start the mana absorption process. The sphere starts to go higher, and since normal humans can't survive higher altitudes, the human artificer crew passes out and die, shortening the controls of the null sphere and leaving the killing clouds to linger. The crew sacrifice their lives in order to take out Yalmoth with his own weapon. We then switch scenes to where we continue to see Yalmoth sipping his wine and admiring his handiwork from the stone chargers. He then orders the ship to fly over Halcyon and defeat the remaining Thran allied forces that are still fighting in the city itself. They land near the granary silos of the city, and Yalmoth's squad begin to fight a group of enemy soldiers. While this is going on, Rebecca and her group of goblins are trying to find a route to the Thran Temple. While Rebecca is afraid that Yalmoth would know their original plans, she gives the task of getting to the Thran Temple up to the goblins, who suggest that they use the sedan chairs, instead of taking the usual route. We then switch scenes to the Thran Temple, where around 2,000 Thran citizens have evacuated to the structure and have taken any sort of ground they could find. While Rebecca and the goblins try to reach the temple, Gix and the ground company arrive at the temple first and begin their attack on the floating structure. The evacuees, most likely getting the control stone from Rebecca in an earlier chapter, begin to use the controls to slowly fly away from the Phyrexians and the jump point they were using to get on the Thran Temple's foundation. As the evacuees yell and cheer about getting away from Gix's Phyrexian company, the war vessel Vengeance arrives moments afterwards. Multiple ropes drop from the side, and almost instantly, numerous Phyrexians begin to land on the temple, not only to slaughter the evacuees, but to take control of the now moving Thran temple. We come back to Yalmoth, where they begin to surround the grain silos, where some Thran citizens are locked inside. These people were also having some success defending themselves in the silos, so Yalmoth orders his group to use the Power Stone Swords and cut down the granary silos in order to destroy their makeshift fortification and massacre the inhabitants inside. The author also reveals that Yalmoth, looking up at the temple while Vengeance is attacking the temple, was that leaving Rebek's floating temple was a great mistake, thinking that Rebek's vision of heaven, symbolized in the Thran temple, would muddy Yalmoth's vision of heaven for the Thran, that being Phyrexia. Moments later though, he realized that something is strange. The white cloud from his stone chargers had not been absorbed by the Null Sphere, had traveled the full 1500 foot elevation, and is now engulfing the city. Part of the White Cloud did rise high enough over the walls and was able to engulf part of Vengeance, which caused the ship to crash into part of the wall before rolling over 1,500 feet down through the Stone Charger's cloud. Yamoth, surprised by what he had just witnessed, then sees the Thran Temple float upward and beginning to escape. The chapter ends with Rebecca and her goblin company trying to reach some sedan chairs through a sewer passage and notice that the Thran Temple is gone. Moments later, however, they begin to hear thousands of people screaming, and live imaging of the Thran Temple begin to appear around the city. It is to Rebecca's horror what is happening. The Thran Temple loses control and crashes, killing all 2,000 souls aboard. Realizing what she had just witnessed, she tells her goblin company to make for the Caves of the Damned, as it is their only hope for survival. Chapter 29 begins, and we see the white cloud from Yalmoth's stone chargers causing significant damage to anything that it touches. Stone, metal, flesh, any matter began to dissolve inside the white cloud, and the author reveals that the other city-states would be bombed with a stone charger if they did not receive the Thran Alliance surrender, leaving the other seven city-states to become disintegrated, just like Halcyon is currently experiencing. Inside the streets, seeing other people being disintegrated by the white cloud, any living being from the city 
to the defending military, and even soldiers from the Thrain Alliance began to try to find any form of path underground. In the chaos of all this, Yama finds a way to broadcast himself around the city and convinces the survivors to go into the caves and retreat to his world of Phyrexia. When the speech finishes, the scene ends with the retreating masses quickly trying to scramble down the long path to the planar portal and to Yalmoth's paradise. We then change scenes where we see Rebek and her group of goblins try to open Glaceon's healing capsule. When the capsule is open, they realize that Glaceon is dead, with one of the power stones from his breathing machine being knocked loose. And the author reveals two things. How much Glaceon truly appreciated his goblin assistance, being on the same level as his closest friends, and how Rebek hadn't kissed her husband since the arrival of Yawmoth nearly a decade ago. While Rebek and most of the goblins are given their goodbyes, one of the younger goblins in the group try to persuade the rest, saying that they could still save themselves. Rebek tells the goblins to go, as she will stay behind with Glaceon. As the group is leaving, some of the older goblins bow to Rebek and say their farewell. We then finish with the last scene of the chapter, where we see the multitudes of occupants from Halcyon arrive into the planar portal. Excited to see some of the Halcyon warriors under Yalmoth's command, Giving way to the portal, the refugees sing and cheer as they go through the portal. However, as the refugees begin to come into Phyrexia, they realize the world they stepped into and begin to quickly notice all the Phyrexian horrors surrounding them. Some become shocked and try to retreat back to Halcyon, but they get forced to push forward from both the crowd and the Halcyon guards. The chapter ends with Yawmoth stepping out in front of the new Phyrexian inhabitants and welcomes them to their new home. The last chapter begins with Rebecca holding Glaceon inside the manor rig. She hears the cloud and the destruction coming closer, and she tries to comfort herself, preparing for her death, and by saying to Glaceon's body that they won't be alone soon. She then notices a strange light by Glaceon's wound, and finds a scalpel and digs out the two power stones that Yawmoth implanted in him earlier in the story. She would then start to bring the halves together, and when they collided, bouts of energy shout outward, and Glaceon's essence appears before her. The charged halves of the Power Stone absorb his mind, essence, and his dormant planeswalker power. The two converse, and Glaceon persuades Rebecca to travel down to the caves and use the newly combined Power Stone to place it on the podium by the planar portal in order to trap Yawmoth on Phyrexia forever. Glaceon's essence will remain inside of the Power Stone on the portal's podium and tells Rebecca that he will guard the portal as best as he can. The two also have a heartwarming moment. Rebecca admits that he was wrong about Glaceon and how he was overall a good man, but Glaceon reassured Rebecca that he was not wrong about her. The two kiss each other, and Glaceon tells Rebecca that he loves her. The scene ends with Glaceon telling Rebecca to start making the descent to the planar portal. In the next scene, we see Yawmoth arriving to his inner sanctum in order to reinfuse with Phyrexia's essence. While he was doing this, he realizes Rebecca is not on the plane, and Phyrexia begins to show Yawmoth what she had done while he was gone. He then panicked and pulled away from his world and teleported to the first sphere of Phyrexia and near the Phyrexian side of the planar portal. Rebecca makes it down to the podium and she hesitates putting the power stone in at first. She argues with Glaceon that she wants to wait a little longer so she could appreciate her last look at the sky, which could be seen on Phyrexian's end and also on Glaceon. Moments later, Yomoth arrives by the Phyrexian side of the planar portal and tries to convince Rebecca not to seal the portal and become alone. Rebecca is convinced that Yawmoth will not risk stepping to his side and be sealed from Phyrexia, while Yawmoth tries to continue convincing Rebecca that he offers life and to leave the dead world, all while Glaceon is yelling at Rebecca to seal the portal. Rebecca then replies to both of them that she wants to see the sky one last time, that she wants to hear both of their voices one last time, confirming to both the readers and now to Glaceon that Rebecca did also love Yawmoth. She says goodbye to both men and places the power stone into the podium. Bits of light and energy surge out from the power stone and go into various artifact creatures inside the caves, all while the portal slowly closes off. The very last scene of the novel shows the room going into complete quietness, Rebecca turning around to ascend the stairs from whence she came and to embrace the death from the stone charger cloud. And there you have it everyone, the Thran in a compact summation. The rise of the villain Yawmoth and the downfall of the Thran civilization. To me, one of the better stories in Magic the Gathering. I hope you all enjoyed this video. If you enjoy my content, hit that subscribe button and check out the rest of my videos. Be sure to also listen to the Thran unofficial audiobook that I produced back in 2019 if you want the full story. 
You can also follow me on Twitter and become a Patreon supporter in the link within the description. That's all I have, everyone. This is Coach from the Car Bazaar signing out, and I will see you all in the next video.